All right, so today we're going to try something a little different. Um, it's fall break week, so we'll try to get out of here a little quicker than normal. And uh, hopefully this will be a little easier to manage. You've got a uh, review handout sheet, just like every week that you can go through, and we'll take a look at answering those questions as we go through um, our information today. You still have um, access to the entire module. What I've done this week is kind of boil it down to uh, the major high points that we're going to take a look at that we want you to know, uh, know most uh, for the discussion-based assessment. <clears throat> In a couple weeks, we're going to have a discussion-based assessment. And a DBA is that. It's a discussion. It's a, it's a discussion between you and your teacher about what you've learned. And so uh, one of the beauties of a a discussion-based assessment is that you don't have to know a lot of specific dates uh, if you you know get stuck on a name particular name it's less important so uh, as opposed to a multiple choice question where those very specific things are incredibly important in a discussion-based assessment what's important is that you have a general understanding of the concepts that we're discussing so that you can just talk intelligently about it. So um, instead of saying, you know, you need to know specific dates about things, know more about the general, uh, how were those, uh, the events of the time reflected through art? How did those, how did the art change and how is it reflective of that, that time period? Well, you know, the exact, exact dates of that time period is not nearly as important. So we're going to start, start with uh, the um, Hellenistic art and, and looking at how we've, we've talked about archaic and that classical early, mid, and, and, and sort of late classical. Now we're going into Hellenistic. And this is sort of that late, the last part of the Greek uh, empire before the Romans kind of um, put a, a hooey on everything and steal all the great Greek stuff. And so um, we're looking at how... Hellenistic is different than those uh, earlier uh, Greek uh, time periods, how the artists evolved and how it's reflective again of that time period. Uh, uh, Hippodamos, which I'm going to tell you right now, I, I feel bad for that guy. You know, middle school, he probably got hit ridiculed. Hippodamos, Hippodamos, it's a terrible name. Uh, the order, proportion, and reason of his layout uh, in his cities is evidence of the classical period. And what we're looking at here is. Um, how during the Hellenistic period these city-states had evolved and we've been talking all along about how uh, Greece and, and this entire region was dominated by these city-states one kind of overtaking the other and so um, the looking at the structure how they laid out the structure that he would Im impose was a very strict structure that used right angles the, the and, and if you look at the top uh, image here on the right you'll see that the, uh, the the it was like a grid pattern if you will that established the streets and everything and it wasn't reflective of the environment around it they just level everything get everything flat and build everything uh, in nice little neat rows uh, section of town into residential commercial religious regions we sort of do that today you know uh, it's kind of the, the early onset of uh, those business districts versus your resi residential areas um, how it differs if you think of the Hellenistic period uh, Hellenistic period were all about sort of the naturalistic elements going on and um, so what, what we see different you know um, urban planners start to incorporate that geography around them if you look here this is uh, in the bottom right you've got a, um, a large sort of arboretum a, a, a large theater built into the hillside. They're making natural use of the resources. The streets and roads are reflective of the environment around them. Uh, not true uh, of the Hippodamus plan. Uh, the artist of Pergamon recorded the Pergamese victory over the Gauls with twisting forms. And so now we're looking again, how is that art changing? How is it reflective of the time? What's going on in man's understanding? Through the archaic period, we saw these very rigid understandings of what people looked like and how they changed. And now we're seeing a, a much more uh, emotional uh, type of um, reflection. Uh, the Hellenistic artists continue to break tradition with that classical canon. Um, 
when we think about, again, if you look at the top three figures, you're looking at archaic, sort of mid-classical, and late classical. Uh, and then below that, the two at the bottom are the Hellenistic. So you can see the progression and, and start thinking about now how is that reflective of what's going on in society and, and, and what where man's understanding is uh, of his place. So in the archaic, we see in the top left, that archaic image, man is very rigid. And, and even though that one's sort of already beginning to break, going to mid-classical, we see the, the, the legs are separated. They're not just stuck together. Uh, but um, And it's already getting a little more naturalistic. If we remember the Egyptians before this, even were even more rigid, uh, more stylized. As we go through that mid classical period, that top middle, we see much more naturalization. The, the proportions of the body become more naturalistic. If we compare that to the archaic, it was really thin, small waist. Now we're getting a more normal waist, but still a fairly idolized uh, or idealized, if you will. Um, uh, perception of the human uh, body, and 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 that's sort of reflective of where they're they're beginning to evolve from. You think of those Egyptians and the early Greeks were all about the gods, and and that's when now we're starting to see an emphasis shift towards man and towards uh, humanistic uh, elements. And so when we look at the late classical on the far right, now we've got this juxtaposition. We talked about that where you've got the counter pose or shoulder goes one way hips go the other very natural the way that people actually stand uh we see uh the, i think they kind of counter post up you know the the uh the way that's twisted but with a foot up the leg up the arm up there's kind of this this very naturalized movement beginning to take place by hellenistic whoo man we got all kinds of cool stuff it's very naturalized very flowing and so uh, that's that artistic rebellion against those classical norms now we got themes like female nudes um, uh, sexual energy and you know just really breaking with that understanding that we're gonna be reverent towards the gods now we're gonna start reflecting what's man really like and what are the impulses uh, and uh, uh, and the conditions that man um, you know, can be seen in, and so we see, you know, here this this is a, a reflection of the gods, and, and not as the, the god isn't this all powerful uh, and unable to be, but he's tormented he's in this tormented sort of uh, twisting uh, position, and so uh, we're gonna, that's that's kind of gotten away from that again that classical and archaic. Um, uh, looks at uh, how art's reflective uh, of that society. Um, we look at how athletes, uh, if you remember in the the Egyptians, initially the, the athletes were all very prim and proper, and then we start to slowly see them. Remember, they were, I think they were playing games, tying their shoes, and slowly working their way towards little normalistic things. But here we go. Uh, just like as it, as it evolved through archaic and the classical, uh, through Hellenistic, so does a representation of the uh, the athlete as well. So by the time we get to Hellenistic, <coughs> the uh, present representation is completely altered, it's completely different. Now we, we see uh, this is the boxer over on the right, and then in this Hellenistic form, whew, he's tired, um, he's worn out, his nose has been broken, uh, he looks battered, he looks tired. Human condition, it's about human condition. Um, exhausted, yeah. Uh, the uh, counter look at that counter pose to the uh, the discus thrower there on the bottom left, which is more reflective of that earlier Greek period where they're still idolizing the human body. We're still about the human body's perfect. We're still man's becoming the center, but uh, that's because man is so perfect. In Hellenistic, we realize man's not perfect, and and all those flaws are what make us uh, human. So again understand more about how that art is reflective of the time and not as much about the dates. In the latter half of the second century BC, the Romans put an end to the Greek autonomy and the Greeks themselves became subject to Rome. Mm. So this is the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, I got to study in Italy for a summer and I'm going to tell you right now uh, that uh, it looks like a, uh, an old cat lady lives there. There are, well there were thousands of cats around it, hundreds anyway. Greece loses its political and economic dominance, um, but still remains culturally significant. Even to this day, man, we've got Greek uh, everything to this very day. 
the Etruscan civilization, and uh, the second part of this is what we're talking about today. And I just kind of want to put it into perspective uh, geographically. This, where were we talking about? This is all really Italy. We're all mostly, for the most part, in, in, in and around Italy. Rome, of course, is in Italy. Uh, Greece is not far from Italy. <laughs> uh, the Etruscans part of Italy. Uh, so uh, what we're when we're thinking about um, what we're talking about now, we're, we're we're still in a very small region uh, of the world. We're not looking at the art of Asia yet, really, and and, and what's going on because it's it's not like nothing was going on anywhere else in the world. Just Italy was only people on Earth. <laughs> that's not was, but that's what we're focusing on. And so I just want you to understand, we're looking at how. Even though these cultures or civilizations were divided politically, uh, geographically, they're, they're pretty interrelated. And so that's why we're going to see uh, the uh, archaic period the, the Etruscans went through, very similar to what the Greeks went through, uh, because they're just a stone's throw away. Uh, so <laughs> the Etruscans are a vibrant culture influenced by that Greek uh, culture. They used the Greek alphabet. Um, politically, the state was a loose confederation of city-states. Each had their own king. And again, city-states were the thing back then. Um, the fibula, a large safety pin used on the, uh, by the ancients to hold up their garments at the shoulder. And if you've ever watched any movies where or seen the toga things, the togas are held very often with these. Uh, they established their own cultural norms in their archaic period. And we're going to look more at how their art evolved. But you can see here, um, this is all Etruscan, but we can see influences in the same sort of uh, understanding uh, of man's place in the world reflected in the Etruscan as we do what we saw in the Greeks. Uh, if you look at the bottom left, these, you know, the, the idea of the athletes. Again, um, this is sort of late archaic period, I guess, or early classical period, if you will, for the Etruscans. And what we're seeing is that uh, the, still stylized form, but understanding the humanity. That's a, a fallen, uh, and I guess it's really more of that's probably not less athletic, more soldier, but we see that, 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 that understanding the human condition. Um, yeah, in the very middle, we see that's a very archaic reflection. And again, very straight up and down pose. The figure is straight up and down, not really turned, not twisted. Again, very similar to what we saw in the archaic period with the Greeks. Uh, where the Greeks used stone, the Etruscans used wood, brick, and terracotta. They didn't have uh, uh, the same access and understanding of how to use the stone. Uh, the Etruscan temples were built on, on a podium and were accessed, accessed by a small central staircase, unlike the Greek temples, which you can be accessed from all the sides. At the bottom, you see uh, a Greek temple. The other things that the columns are placed only in the front, you'll see in the Greeks, they go all the way around. There is also no pediment. If you look at the top of the uh, Greek um, building at the bottom, you'll see uh, the pediment and then the sculpture uh, where, where they would often have those little um, relief sculptures. And then uh, you look at the overhang. The roof overhang is enormous in those Etruscan, uh, Etruscan temples compared to the Greeks. So those are the differences. Uh, make sure you jot these things down filling out that form as we go through. Architectural sculpture came in the form of acroteria, a figure or ornament placed usually at the top or edge of the ranking cornice, or sculptures that were placed on the roof. Inside, there were three cellas, each one for the principal gods, Tania, Uni, and Minerva. Uh, Etruscan temples resembled a home for the gods rather than a sacred shrine. And so just kind of looking inside of these, much different than what we saw with the Greeks. Um, you know, the, the, these temples sometimes uh, made use even of the natural environment around them. Uh, you see that that one's got that, that the the dome over it. Uh, but these um, these spaces inside still paid homage to gods, much like the Greeks. So the differences are primarily in their structure, the design, but its purpose is very similar. Uh, the Etruscan archaic style is full of movement and energy. We see the archaic smile, but the Etruscan version is much more animated than the Greeks. If you look on the right, the mouth is sort of open, and so we get, you know, versus that weird uh, smile that looks like they're having an accident or something, I don't know, uh, that the archaics had uh, in the Greek archaic. The Etruscan archaic is a little more naturalized. They're, they're, they're kind of advanced a little faster than the Greeks did. 
Uh, the flat ripple folds of the god's garment are also characteristic of the early Etruscan sculpture. Uh, a preferred medium for the Etruscans was terracotta. It's like a red clay you're probably familiar with it, with the pots that you get to put plants in. Um, the sarcophagus or stone clay coffin shows a couple reclining, possibly at a banquet. And again, we're looking at how, if you look at the face, the stylistically, they look archaic. But if we look at the relaxed pose, they're more mid-classical Greek as we compare it to what that Greek uh, art looked like. The animated faces and gesture and arms are characteristic of this period. And the relaxed poses that differentiate their art from the pose of the Egyptian funerary sculpture. And if you think the Egyptian funerary sculpture was very stiff, if you, th you think about, they wouldn't have anybody reclined, laid back, doing anything. They were very stiff and, uh, and rigid. In 509 BCE, the Romans overthrew the Etruscan monarchs and established a republican government, setting the stage for the eventual domination of the Italian peninsula and the whole of the Mediterranean. The Romans whew, take over everything. Uh, the bronze capital wolf, uh, 500 uh, BCE, is a depiction of the legendary beast and just Romulus and Remus. If you ever go to Rome, you're going to see this sculpture with the babies uh, attached to it. Those were added later. Um, but Romulus uh, and Remus, if you are a Star Trek fan, as I understand it, that's where Romulans come from. Is the Romulus? <laughs> uh, I don't know uh, if that's the uh, uh, what Gene Roddenberry had in, in in mind, but that's that's the the hubbub of what I've heard. It's kind of interesting though the uh, the story between Romulus and Remus, and and so the Romans used that at the, in this sculpture as as sort of a um, a representation or a, uh, of their society kind of became um, oh what's the word I'm looking for here a symbol a symbol for the uh, for the uh, Roman society all right guys um, oh, that's it for today uh, we'll talk more on the backside have a great day